Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. Recently, we have been reading in the book of Revelation. And it just seems to get more exciting as we go. This time, I'd like to have you take your Bible, turn it to the chapter 14 of the book of Revelation, and let's read a very powerful message called the third angel's message. It starts with verse 9 of chapter 14. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoso receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's a severe message. What does it mean? Yes. Well, last week we talked a little bit about this, but we're, we're getting into the real heart of it now. And let's see. There were some words that sound kind of scary in there. Indeed. And I understand that Billy Graham used to say this is his key text for believing in the eternal torment of the wicked. Forever and ever. Isn't that what that says? Smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They have no rest day nor night. Sounds like a pretty miserable situation. Yeah, and this is part of the good news? How can this be a part of the good news? Well, it's not so good news for those people. I don't care how you put it. It's not good news for them. <laughs> I see. Well, we, there's, pick some words out of that. You all got your Bibles open. <coughs> pick out a word or two or three in that passage that might need some explanation. Torment. Torment. Okay. Fury. Fury. Sulfur. Sulfur. Ever and ever. Forever and ever. Indignation in some translations. Wrath is another one. What do we do with those words? Well, last time we ended talking about how these messages might have been interpreted by the people in John's day when they first received the book. And then we started to talk about how these messages might have been interpreted by the people who arose out of that great uh, Christian awakening in the early, late 1700s and early 1800s. How, how do you suppose they understood these messages. Uh, I understand that William Miller was talking about the second advent and he, he came along and said, yeah, this is, here it says right here, the, you know, the, the hour of God's judgment has come. That's exactly what we're talking about, right? Back in, in the first angel's message. Um, so they, they believe the Adventists were a part of that Millerite movement and and other people in other places and other parts of the world doing something similar, they said, there's no question about it. Jesus is going to come again, and we think the time is going to be October 22, 1844. But then that. they expected this to happen at that time. They Well, hold on. Let, let, let's do this one at a time. They expect God's judgment in the first angel's message to happen at that time. They yeah. said they believed that God's judgment was coming, and that's when it was going to happen. And this was going to be, this is going to happen at the, at, at the point when Jesus arrives. That's, that's when the judgment's going to take place. We had a couple other dates earlier. Yeah. 
but then they re finally refined it to that. And, and let's talk about that briefly. How did they arrive at October 22, 1844? That sounded like a date out of the middle of nowhere. Well, what happened, let's just talk about this. The first thing they did is they said, they read Daniel 8, 14 and, and Daniel 9 and tried to put the pieces together. And they, they, they couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, they said, well, this 2300-day prophecy of Daniel 8, 14 has to start somewhere. How do we know where it starts? And then in Daniel 9, it says, 70 weeks are cut off for my people. So they said, well, cut off from what? Well, it must be cut off from that longer period of time. And if, without going into a lot of detail, there are hints in the Hebrew that is talking about that same prophecy, cut off from that prophecy. So you, if you cut something off, you can't cut it out of the middle. You have to either cut it out of the beginning or out of the end. Well, clearly it can't be cut out of the end because we're, you know, it's, it's some, the end is clear down here somewhere. So it must have been cut off at the beginning. So therefore, they concluded that the 70-week prophecy must have started at the same time that the 2300-day prophecy started. Well, when did that start? Well, it says, Daniel 9, from the going forth of, well, I mean, it's, it, it says, a prophecy, and I, I'm not gonna, we're not going to redo Daniel, but basically it says it's, it, a certain period of time is set aside to God's people, the, the Jews. And if you go back to, uh, well, it says from the, from the day of the decree to going forth, and if you go back to Ezra, and you read carefully, and you find out that that was a time when Ezra, was given commission to take a group of Jews back to Jerusalem because he was given specifically information, okay, rebuild the temple, I mean, finish rebuild, not rebuilding the temple, but reestablishing the correct worship of the temple, but also you're given permission to restore Jerusalem. Well, he didn't get the job done. Nehemiah had to come and help him. The two of them got the job done together, but the, the date, it just turns out that luckily enough, we can tie the dating to some astronomical phenomenon, and we can tell you that that date happened probably in August of 457 B.C., that start date, August of 457 B.C. So if you take 457 off of 2300, what do you get? 1843. 1843, yes, what you come up with. And that's what, for a long time, they thought, okay, that's the date, 1843. And then they realized that when they went back into history, that there never was a, day, there never was a year zero. The guys who calculated the B.C. and the A.C. dates, they had 1 B.C. and then it was 1 A.D. So you had to extra, add an extra year, so now they got up to 1844. But how did they get to October 22, 1844? The Day of Atonement in 1844. They said, okay, we, this seemed to be following something, has something to do with the pattern of the Jewish temple thing and so forth. It seems to be following that pattern. So maybe we need to go back into the Jewish system and learn something. And they went back and they learned about the Day of Atonement in the Jewish calendar and so forth. And it turns out that the Day of Atonement happened on October, that year happened on October 22 of 1844. And they said, that's got to be the right date. The date when Jesus is going to come back again. Which is the Day of Atonement? The one on 1844? Yeah. Okay. The Jewish Day of Atonement in 1844 happened on October 22 that so year. So they made that assumption by how? Why? Well, because, because they saw that, they saw, okay, Daniel was looking for these prophecies. He was thinking in terms of the Jewish calendar year and so forth. So they assumed that because they didn't know anything about the years that we know. They never heard of a Julian calendar or Gregorian calendar and all those things. So, so it, it would be fair if, you, if they were back there to, to follow their, their time scale, their beginning of the year and sequence through the year and so forth when you're looking at this prophecy, and that's what they concluded. But the, the prophecy said, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Yeah. And so it was the word sanctuary that had them back looking at the, at the sanctuary of the of the desert and when did it get cleansed it got cleansed on the day of atonement on the day of atonement every yeah. year and so they said well if this is reality and the sanctuary is going to be cleansed then let's look at the day of atonement well there's actually two things that are happening they're counting days from a certain point mm -hmm. but within that year there they're 
they're not really measuring a distance, they're just putting that right on to the Day of yeah. Atonement. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, somewhere I heard, Ken, that they, they had realized that uh, the Jewish calendar what, has only 360 days in it, and we had to say they had to make some accommodations there, but all they would have to do is just consult with the Jewish folk who would know, hey, th this is the Day of Atonement. Yeah, that's what they did. They consulted with the, one of the most strict Jewish groups that they could find, and they said, this is the Day of Atonement. Yeah. Uh, I, won't, I won't bore you or maybe just completely confuse you by explaining the different calendar systems that were used in ancient times. There were some bizarre. The Jews, for example, you're talking about the Jews, they only had 360 days in their year. 12, year, 12 months, 30 days each. So, but we know that it takes 365 and one fourth days for the moon, for the earth to go around the sun. So what happens to those five and a quarter days? Well, every, uh, every seven years out of every 19 years, now that gets really confusing, but seven years out of every 19 years, approximately every three years, the high priest would declare, okay, it's time to have a leap month. And they would have two months by the same name. Abib 1, Abib 2. And so they had a leap month. We have a leap day, you know. <laughs> On every leap year, we have, we have, you know, we have one day extra. Yeah, sure but they would have a whole month extra. And then that would get their calendar back, back about to the right place until three years later, get off a little bit. Whack, we'll throw in a whole month. Just to give have, you an idea. You can't add 30 days every three years if it's only five days difference. Well... It, that yeah. should be every six years or so. Yeah. What actually happened was, th was that they were trying to follow the moon. And so it wasn't actually 30 days. It was 29 and a quarter days, I think, is the actual thing. And so they had one month of 30 days, the next month of 29 days, the next month of 30 days. That, that's what happened when they finally got a little more sophisticated in following the calendar. So they had their six more days. Yeah, but you're counting years yeah. from, the, from the 2,300 days. Yeah. So there's, all that goes out the window because all you need to do is just to follow the, the, follow the um, first moon every, right. every year yeah. and do that. But the, the October thing, that's a little bit... But, but little I'm saying bit. they have... The way they calculate the October thing is based on this old system. Mm -hmm. That's why I was just mentioning it just briefly. Anyway, so the, of course a great disappointment happened. Well, but let, let's talk about what led up to it. So here were all these people flocking out of a whole variety of churches to this movement. It wasn't a church, it was a movement. And they, there were so many people who'd come to these meetings, they, they actually at one time owned the largest tent that had been known up to that point in time in the United States and maybe in the world, a tent that was big enough to hold 4,000 people. And they often had thousands of more people standing outside listening because they wanted. And more and more preachers from different churches said, yes, we believe this. They left their churches and came and preached the Advent message. But what was the response from these other churches? <coughs> the, 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 Advent, the Advent believers were leaving? They, they weren't well received. They weren't, they well, weren't and, happy. And weren't, weren't, these, weren't these Adventists, weren't they saying... Come out of Babylon, my people? You not know? yet, not oh, yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ellen White and her family were disfellowshipped because, because of their belief in the Advent, and many others were disfellowshipped. And at first they just said, okay, no problem, we'll just, we're over here, we'll worship together, no problem. But as this went on, and more and more people were being disfellowshipped and so forth, they said, well, look at what the second angel says. A second angel followed the first one, saying, She has fallen, great Babylon has fallen, she made all people drink her wine, the strong wine of her immoral lust. This must be all these churches that are throwing us out. We've got the truth, we've got the Advent message, and we're leaving them behind. They must be Babylon, they must be fallen. So in the, in the 1840s, Babylon has fallen referred to what group? I guess they would call it apostate Protestantism. They would have called it that what they regarded as the apostate mostly Protestant churches of that day that were disfellowshipping the Advent believers. Mm -hmm. See? So then it came up to the great day of disappointment, and then they lived through that, and only a few people remained faithful, really, after that, uh, to the Advent message. They said, William Miller's research was done, done so well, it can't be wrong. I mean, it can't be completely wrong. There must be 
most of it must be true. Where did we make our mistake? And they noticed several things, and I don't think we need to go through all of them, but they said, for example, in the prophecy that talks about the king who went away from his home country to be crowned somewhere else, they said, oh, Jesus left this earth and he went somewhere else to receive his kingdom. And they talked about other prophecies that imply the same kind of thing. And so they said, maybe, and, and specific, we probably need to look at one of those places. Look at, look at um, Daniel 7. And we'll start with, well, let's start with verse 9. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. His clothes were white as snow. His hair was like pure wool. His throne, mounted on fiery wheels, was blazing with fire. Who do you suppose that's talking about? A stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were open. Who's, who's sitting on the throne? Jesus. Has to be God. Yes. Has to be God. There's no other way you can make that, stretch that any other way. While I was looking, I could still hear the little horn. He's been talking about the little horn earlier in the chapter. And it's uh, bragging and boasting. As I watched, the fourth beast was killed and his body was thrown into the flames and destroyed. The other beasts had their power taken away, but they were permitted to go on living for a limited time. During this vision in the night, I saw what looked like a human being he was approaching me, surrounded by clouds, and he went to the one who had been living forever and was presented to him. He was given authority, honor, and royal power so that the people of all nations, races, and languages would serve him. His authority would last forever and his kingdom would never end. Now, who's that going to be? Oh, Jesus. Someone who looks like a human being, approaches the Father, and is given authority to rule forever. It has to be Jesus. There can't be any other explanation for that. So... Daniel was very alarmed about this whole thing. He said, you know, what's going on here? Well, it, you notice that if we look back here, this is a judgment scene, isn't it? Yeah. A judgment scene's going on. And who's being judged? Yeah. No. People. No, I, people, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Does it explicitly say? Doesn't explicitly say. Okay, well, they looked at this and they said, the judgment must be happening. I mean, we're not, we don't see God down here on this earth living, you know, living on his fire, sitting on his fiery throne and so forth, doing his judging. The judging must be taking place where? In heaven. In heaven. And Jesus is approaching his father where? In heaven. In heaven. So apparently what happened in 1844 on October 22 was something that took place in, in heaven. So they began to teach that. And they also noticed then in, in verse 12 of, of Revelation 14, what does it say? This, this calls, calls, okay, go ahead. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Okay, so what are the descriptive words for these people? They keep the commandments of God, have the faith of Jesus. And they have the faith of Jesus. And as they were studying all these things, some people came to this group, a small group, actually people who'd come from the Seventh-day Baptist Church, and they said, how come you don't keep the commandments of God? And they said, we are keeping the commands. What are you going for? He said, no, you're not. You're not worshiping on Saturday. And they looked at their calendar and they said, what? It's true. Saturday is the seventh day of the week. And it says they're supposed to worship on the seventh day of the week. And they were just totally shocked. And they did some research and they said, yeah, this is seen to, seems to be correct. The days the Jews are worshiping on seem to be the day that God has commanded us to worship on. So some of them gradually began to worship on the seventh day. And eventually they said, this message now applies to this group of people who are now faithfully observing all of the Ten Commandments and have the faith of Jesus. So, we're now, we're now down to the place where we're talking about the seal of God and the mark of the beast. We talked about the mark of the beast earlier. What's the seal of God? Does this, does this start to come into focus now? Isn't it the Holy Spirit? Well, we, we can read something about the Holy Spirit. Look, for example, 
uh, at uh, excuse me while I get there on my computer. Let's turn to Ephesians, and let's really re look at Ephesians 4.30 to begin with. It says, And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free. So clearly, God's mark has something to do with the work of the Holy Spirit, right? And go back a couple of chapters into chapter 1 and look what it says in verse 13 and you also became God's people when you heard the true message the good news that brought you salvation you believed in Christ and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised okay so how does that fit together so what is the Holy Spirit to do with them yes I mean getting the Holy Spirit it must be for a purpose. What is that purpose? Yes, exactly. Well, these people appear to be God's special people. God's put his stamp of ownership on them. That would be the first thing, right? And what, what, what has God done through the Holy Spirit that's a benefit to all of us every day? He's given us the Bible. Given us the Bible. The, the Holy Spirit's one main gift to humanity is he was the one who inspired the prophets, he's the one who inspired the apostles. The Bible is God's spirit, for, God's gift, I'm sorry, the Holy Spirit's gift to us. So, okay, if the Holy Spirit has given us the Bible and he's the one who seals us, how do you suppose he would seal us? If we're doing what it says. If we're reading it and studying it and seeing our lives transformed by beholding. that beholding of, of Jesus, right? So this would, we're starting to see a contrast here. The people who have the mark of the beast are known because they do the easy thing. They do what the whole world is doing. They're the ones who avoid the persecution. They're the ones who, that's Revelation 13, 16 to 18. The people who have, going through all these difficult times we've talked about in the first part of Revelation 14, come down to the place they're keeping the commandments and so forth, and these are the people who are going to get God's mark of ownership on them. <coughs> right? Yes. So, here we have these two contrasting periods. These two, not, I'm sorry, these two contrasting marks and, or seals. And these are, these are the ones that so in other words, this would suggest several things. The first thing would suggest that how many different groups are going to be, are there going to be at the end? Two. One group is going to be worshiping who? The devil. Where would you get that idea? <laughs> I could say so. Hmm? Well, what, what does that involve? The dragon, who was the devil, gave power to a beast, and this beast is what's causing all this problem. Well, look at Revelation 13, verse 3. Let's just see what's going to happen. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded. We've, ta we've suggested that that was the time when the Pope was arrested and that people thought the Catholic Church was dead. But the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. And what was the result? Everyone worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshiped the beast also, saying, who is like the beast, who can fight against it? I mean, here's someone who's apparently dead, and he's come back to life, and the power behind all that looks like it's the devil. The devil is able to raise people to life. I mean, I mean how far can you carry this? And this, was, this is his message. See? This is his message. So everyone worships the dragon? Does it seem possible that the world could end up worshiping the dragon today? How, what would that look like? I guess it looked like Sodom and Gomorrah and we're getting closer every day. Yes. Well, <clears throat> do, you, do we see people who are demon possessed in our day? Not frequently. Not frequently. Or we don't recognize it. How would you? Think so. How, how, how would you decide? A deceiver, so. How would you recognize a demon-possessed person? I think so. I think that whoever did what 
happen in Boston. You know, you cannot have the spirit of God and be able to do something like that. People destroying other people's yes. lives, setting up bombs, evil. destroying people. It's just evil. Evil. Yeah. But th there, there's, a, there's a hint. With, with this was suggested by a friend of mine. I think he was spot on. He said, look, the devil is working the world in every possible way he can imagine. He's going to do everything he can. Now, there's going to be two kinds of people. There are going to be one group of people who say, the truth is the truth as presented in Scripture, and we're going to be dead on course, and we're going to follow that no matter what. We're going to, in other words, our compass is focused on what? Jesus, the truth in Scripture. I don't care if we die, we're, going to, we're not going to deviate from that. Most of the population, by far the biggest group of people on this world, are going to say, that's too much trouble. <laughs> I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to, whatever feels good, I'm going to do it. And, I mean, whatever feels, what are people doing these days to make them feel good? Everything. Drugs. Oh, all kinds of stuff alcohol. to take. <laughs> Music. Entertainment. So forth like this. Now, let me ask you this question. Do you think the devil knows how to use those modalities? Does he know how to use drugs? Does he know how to use music? Does he know how to use television? Does he know how to use the internet? Well, he's probably inspired most of what you it comes along. You be better believe it. So if your life is oriented to feeling good, and that comes through music, drugs, internet, television, etc., etc., when the devil takes full control of those things, who's going to be controlling you? Don't just sit there and look at each other. <laughs> devil. It's the dragon, is what it says, and the dragon is the devil. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the whole world is going to be quietly moving into the devil's camp. He gets a beast to do his bidding. He gets and it says the whole world worshiped the beast. Mm -hmm. It didn't say they worshiped the dragon. They worshiped the beast. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and wonder, we get, was it Revelation 13? So, uh, dragon. But it does say they worship the dragon. In Revelation 13, 4, it it everyone dragon? worshiped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. Okay, there we go. And uh, everybody asked for their face east for all their blessings. Yeah. Well, so. Here's the, here's the thing then. There's going to be some people who are going to say, okay, I'm, my, my life is going to be focused on the, new, uh, on the Bible. I'm going to study what it says here, and I want to be like Jesus as much as possible. Come hell or high water, even if I die, this is where I want to go. This is what the kind of... Jesus is the kind of person I want to be. And there, those people, like Jesus on the cross, who, who every, every feeling he could possibly have told him, Get out of here. Give up on these people. They don't care about you. Just go back to heaven. You don't need to go through all this. He thought all that. I mean, that was the, the feelings that were just overwhelming him. But he said, no, I and my father have agreed on a plan, and this is the plan, and I'm going through with it. And these people are going to have to do the same thing. They're going to have to say, the Bible is our plan. We're going to follow the, we believe this is the picture of God, the true picture of God is presented in Scripture, and we're not going to deviate from that. Well, you're going to have to figure out what the picture is first. Yeah. And that's... Now, why, why would people get that way? Well, this is the stuff we've got to ask ourselves, and that's what we'll talk about when we come back. So don't go away.
Welcome back. And you see, you saw we're right in the middle of something trying to figure out how could the devil really, I mean, doesn't, does this, one of the heads of the beast was, seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. Everyone worshiped the dragon. Come on now. You think the whole world could end up worshiping the devil? That's what it says right there, Revelation 12. It says that the dragon is a devil, Revelation 12. And here it says, through Revelation 13, verse 4, everyone's worshiping the dragon. Well, in Revelation 12, 4, it says, Men worship the dragon, for the dragon had given his authority to the beast, mm -hmm. and they worship the beast. Mm -hmm. So apparently they see the beast. The beast is something they can see. Yeah. They can't see the dragon, but they can see this thing that is def labeled yeah. as the beast. And, 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 and they take the medicine. They listen to the music. They, they, they look at the Internet. They, they listen to television. That's what they see. But what's going on behind is... There's, there's rec on record, you can go to on YouTube and check it down. They sold their souls for rock and roll. The, 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 the ones that really make, have made it big in, in the past were, had given themselves over to sell their soul to the devil. And the same thing applies in, in movies and, and that, that type of entertainment. They, they t t uh, incorporate or they, they become, so to speak, that, that character that they're, they're portraying. How do they get that? And the devil's working on them. Would would that be true for uh, certain preachers? I don't think we can exempt them. You know, you, you, you think people are attracted to something that's charismatic. That's, uh, so, you think for, the devil is charismatic? Oh, the well, he has his. There, tools of the devil, tools of the beast. The fruit is pleasing to the eye and looks like it would be good to eat. Yeah, and you're going to become like God if you eat it. Mm -hmm. And that was not a lie. That was the truth. So what kind of things will differentiate between these faithful, the faithful ones and the other ones? Will, will you be able to tell? Or will they just be a hodgepodge and you won't be able to tell who's, who's God's on God's side and who's on the devil's side? By their fruit, you will know them. <laughs> okay, what, what, that's what I want to know. Tell me, am I picking an apple or a pear? <laughs> the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. Okay. Uh, to my knowledge, there's only been one criteria given to the law and to the testimony. Mm -hmm. If they speak not according to this word, mm -hmm. there's no law in them. So when, when somebody or something or some organization comes to you with a proclamation, check it out. Okay. Uh, are there any very open signs that you can tell between, I mean, in, in John's day, very specifically, Domitian said every, every person, once a year, had to go to a special place in his city. He had to pick up some incense. He had to carry it over and place it on the altar in front of the statue of Domitian and say, Domitian is Lord. And thus, that was, you didn't have to worship him really vigorously, but you had to do at least that much, say, Domitian is Lord. And that was his way of identifying Christians because the Christians did what? They refuse to do that. Is there going to be anything clearly clear like that at the end? There's nobody running around on planet Earth saying, okay. saying that they are, they are Lord. Not Actu at all. Yeah, there are. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. Actually, they are. You oh. have, if you're familiar with K Korea, those people, that's all they do. They worship this little man. That's, they don't have time to worship God because that's their focus. And they'll do anything, they'll there, sacrifice anything. There are a lot of people there who mm -hmm. want you to think they're Lord. The, among Hispanics, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a character that calls himself <laughs> Jesus and, and, and does some per, pretty perverse things. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. Maitre or Maitre or something. That, that these. But, but it's not those. That's another one. But, the, the, but, but that's not the big thing. Where, What's going to be the big uniting factor? What's going to bring the whole world together to worship the beast? I mean, you look at this, the first few verses, of, uh, like up to verse 8 of Revelation 13. I mean, this is a, an evangelistic campaign like we have never seen before. The whole world converted? Pretty significant number. How can that be? Well, these people, well, let's ask some questions. Will these people be irreligious? Will they be rejecting religion completely? 
I doubt that very seriously. You know, I've, I've heard that there are no atheists in foxholes. Would that be, uh, well, that may be a clue maybe to some things that will happen <clears> at the end. If this, everything gets really, really scary, well, it happened again in the last couple of days uh, with bombing at the Boston Marathon. And people who are just almost as atheistic as you possibly can imagine and say that they don't believe in God at all, when something like this happens, what is the first thing to do? Call for prayer, right? Yeah. We're all praying for so-and-so. Praying to whom? To what? The slime that comes out of the ooze that turns into creatures? Uh, maybe we could go back to this creature who had a deadly wound mm -hmm. and was healed. Mm -hmm. And evident that's the one that is, is causing, is on one of these sides here. Mm -hmm. What was going on when, before his deadly wound? Well, during the, uh, over a thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church dominated the continent of Europe which was, and even North Africa and so forth. I mean, these were the, these were, they, they were the, the church was the dominant power. And I don't know, do you think it's possible that they could become a dominant power again? If the deadly wound is going to be healed? Well, they make the claim that their mark, that their sign of authority mm -hmm. is that they changed the Jewish Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, from the seventh day Sabbath to the first day Sunday. Okay. And to celebrate the and, resurrection of Jesus Christ. And their evidence for having that authority and that power is the fact that all of the Protestants follow them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's two ways to approach that authority thing. Some of us believe that when God reveals some new truth, it, do, it never changes what he revealed before. So that each new thing that comes along, if it's to be regarded as truth, has to agree, at least not disagree, with what's gone before. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a generally Protestant approach to truth. It's very true of groups like the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We absolutely believe that starting from Genesis, the God's revealed word, each thing that's added through the Old Testament and then the New Testament and things that have happened after that, if it doesn't agree with what went before, it should be rejected. By contrast, there are other groups. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest of those groups, for example, that believe that the church, in its various iterations all the way back to, they would say, back to Adam and Eve, the church is really the one that produces the scriptures. The church has produced the Old Testament, and we're not talking about the Catholic Church, we're talking about God's people that they would regard, as far as they're concerned, the Roman Catholic Church today is God's people. God's people produced the, the Bible, so therefore, God's people ought to have the right and the authority to change it if they want to, at any time. Do we believe that? But at the... No. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> That's a very different, that's just the opposite way of looking at, that's right. at revelation right. and, and how, you re, how, you, how you deal with it. If I may, mm -hmm. I, okay, I agree that we believe that scripture should not be broken, but in reality, we have changed things to get along with other people. We have diluted certain things just to fit in or to just not look so weird and what have you. Like what? Uh, quite a few, because I remember this, as a child growing up as a Seventh-day Adventist, it was very different than it is now. What my mother taught me and made me do, uh, in all honesty, I don't put on my son. There was a sort of, it, at that time I thought it was a yoke, an unnecessary yoke that was put on us that I don't do to my son. Uh, after, by Friday evening, I was like, it was trepidation, like, oh my God. <laughs> It was, because my mom was like the Jews. You couldn't touch this. You couldn't do this. She, she made our lives miserable. And maybe that was an unnecessary yoke. It was. Well, and that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. It's a very difficult and a very touchy question. 
of the changes that have been happening over the last 50 years in our Adventist culture, for example, are they for the better or for the worse? Good Be careful. Question. The, the, the good your question. answer might depend on how gray your hair is. <laughs> well, it depends on whether you appreciate the changes that I appreciate and don't appreciate the changes I don't appreciate. There you go. All a person, a matter of personal opinion, right? <laughs> it's relative. So well, how to pick pick an ex well, I don't know if this a you know, I, what do we do with Paul when he says women are supposed to be quiet and not <laughs> supposed to say anything? Mm -hmm. What Other do we do things like that and uh, what do we do with Paul when he goes to Corinth and says, I know what they voted in Jerusalem, but out here we don't really need to worry <laughs> about that. <laughs> huh? <laughs> What do we oh. do about that? <laughs> well, it's very clear if we take Paul's writings and if we take uh, what Ellen White says uh, in explaining what Paul said, you come up to the conclusion that God expects each one of us to study it for ourselves, consult with our friends, study the Bible together, but ultimately we will have to make up our own decision and stand on the basis of what we believe is right. And there we're back to this, the difference between are we going to follow the crowds or are we going to stand singly and alone, as Ellen White says. Well, how do, you, how do you put that into perspective when, for example, the history of, of Loma Linda University, when Ellen White told Burden, look, go buy the property, and the general conference said no. Not the general conference president, all the general conference officials and that whole, the whole body of the official corporate church was saying, don't borrow that money, it's a crazy thing to do. And, yeah. And she had several experiences like that. At Battle Creek College, she's told them to get more land and they oh. got this tiny little bit and so who do you believe there? Well, how, how many third grade graduates do you know who started universities and medical centers? And <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that there, there you've touched on a really major point, though. I think when we, when we divorce or when we diminish the information that inspiration has given us through, through the prophets, we're in deep trouble. Israel was in deep trouble. They went running off and got into all kinds of trouble every time they dismissed the prophets as not pertinent for our time. And, and their running off was God letting them go, which is God's wrath. That's right. So things happen, consequences happen, and it isn't God. God lets things happen so that you learn, hopefully. Sometimes well, but, learn a lesson's hard way. But, but using that, and I don't want to belabor this because I, I, I don't... I don't support what I'm proposing here, but you said that you diminish the inspiration. People are led by inspiration, and you've got Paul here, and he, you know, how do you, he says, you know, like the, the things about the women in more than just one place, and don't, I don't want the listeners to think I'm saying women ought to be quiet and not say anything, but, I mean, this seems to be a, a good example of, of what you're what you're illustrating here, only oh. kind of the opposite way around. And but as we have looked back in those times and the situations that they that they had going on in that time in that culture, uh, there was women were doing things in other other churches that uh, were very confusing. Well, and it, let's not call them churches, other religious institutions. Other religious institutions, okay. <laughs> and, and I think we can logically say that Paul was trying to distinguish the people that he wanted to be associated with and that he thought Jesus would associate. He wanted to distinguish them from those others. And so he made some of these. And I think they're kind of local things. Okay, in the last few minutes we have in our time together, I want to go back to 
our passage in, in Revelation 14, the third angel's message, and let's see if we can, in light of everything we've said now, can we interpret the details of that third angel's message? Whoever worships the beast, do we know who the beast is now? Mm -hmm. Well, we can see that that beast is the earthly manifestation of the devil that's working behind it. There's no that's question right. about that and receives the mark of their forehead and on their hand. We've suggested that means the people who find it easier to go along with everybody in the world because it's he's not going to be able to buy and sell unless you do that. So now I think we know who, what kind of a situation that is. They will themselves drink God's wine, the wine of his fury, his anger. What, what, what's God's anger? You want to do that in... What time we have left? <laughs> well, I'm going to give you some verses to look at. How, do, how does done that it before? So <laughs> summarize it. How does that sound? Look at Deuteronomy 4:24. This is one of the places where it talks about that. Deuteronomy 4:24, because the Lord your God is like a flaming fire; He tolerates no rivals. Living, that's the Good News Bible. Living Bible says He's a devouring fire. And you don't have to go all the way back to Deuteronomy. Look at Hebrews 12, 29. Our God is a consuming fire, as, or an all-consuming fire, a devouring fire, an all -devour, a burning fire, destroying fire. The Message Bible says God himself is fire. And we, we looked at, a few moments ago, we looked at Daniel 7. It says God's throne is mounted on what? Fiery wheels blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. And Isaiah 34 14 to 16, let's just look at that. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with eternal flames? Do we want to dwell, dwell with eternal fire and devouring flames and so forth? He who walks uprightly and speaks sincerely, who scorns the gain that is won by oppression, who keeps his hand free from the touch of a bribe, who stops his ears against hearing bloodshed, and close his eyes against looking on evil. He will dwell on the heights. His stronghold will be like will be the rocky fort fastnesses. His bread will be given to him and his water will be sure. The people who do what is right are going to live where? In the fire. In the fire. Did you say it was Isaiah 34? 33. Did I say 34? You said, I thought you said 34 and it should be. Isaiah 33, 33 verses 14 to 16. I was, and I was reading from the Smith Good Speed translation. Um, but that, that same idea is presented in several, in many different translations. 2 Thessalonians 2.8 describes God's presence as his dazzling presence. Uh, Exodus 24.7, the dazzling light of the Lord's presence came down on the mountain. To the Israelites, the light looked like a fire burning on top of the mountain. So, what kind of fire is this? God's glory. This, this is what it looks like around God. This is what it looks like around God, okay? And so, in, in human language, in human experience, the closest thing that they can use to describe whatever that is, is fire. Okay, so what do we come to next in the third angel's message? His wrath, his anger. We've talked about this before. Um, maybe we'll take just a moment or two to do it. The, the, the obvious place to go to is in Romans 1. Look at Romans 1, verse 18. And I wish we had time to spend a lot of time on this, but we don't right now. Right after God's... And this... I mean, Romans 1 fits the third angel's message so well because mm -hmm. Romans 1, 16 and 17 talk about the complete confidence in the gospel. It's God's power to save all who believe and so forth. That's Romans 16, 1, 16. And Romans, so as soon as he starts describing the good news, what is he describing? God's anger is revealed from heaven against all the sin and evil and the people whose evil ways prevent the truth from being known. How can that be part of the good news? Keep reading. Keep reading, exactly. You drop down, how does God's wrath manifested? God's anger manifest? Look at verse 24. It's God has given those people over to do the filthy things their hearts desire. Verse 26, because they do this, God has given them over to shameful passions. And verse 28, because those people refuse to keep in mind the true knowledge about God, He has given them over. The Greek word is paradidomi. paradidomi. He hands them over. So what does God do when He's angry? Let you go. 
Okay, so now we've seen in Revelation 14, we've seen that the fire is God's presence. We've seen that his wrath is when you're running so fast as you can in the other direction. God finally says, nothing more I can do. Let him go. Hosea 4, 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Yeah. Nothing more I can do for him. Okay, reading on. And all who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur. We've talked about the fire already. Before the holy angels, holy angels and the Lamb. How about the sulfur? Where would... I'm not sure. I think the sulfur goes along with fire. Just leave it with sulfur. the fire. Sulfur is... <laughs> when sulfur burns, it's really hot. I think that might be the idea. Okay. Stinks, too. Yeah, it stinks, too, is right. Yeah. Uh, we got in what Jay was saying uh, about Paul uh, saying that women should not speak. But in Revelation 14, uh, verse 4, I think what they say is even worse. These are those who did not defile themselves with women. Do you get defiled by being with women? It, it <laughs> sounds terrible. No, no. no. That, that's, in, in the book of Revelation, women is talking about churches. Oh, thank God. <laughs> yeah, and we're going to read some about some pretty bad women coming up in chapter 17, especially, and so forth, 18. So, now we've got down to the fire and sulfur. The smoke of the fire that torments them goes up forever and ever. What about the forever and ever? Got to understand that. Where are we going to go to understand? Yeah, June 7, and you got uh, Isaiah 34, uh, 9 and 10. Well, let's go back before that. Let's go back to Exodus 21, verse 6. And I'm going to pick one of the more traditional translations because it'll, it'll be more obvious here. Assuming my Bible will go there. Come on. There we go. Then his master. Now, this is, talk, this is right after the giving of the Ten Commandments. Right there at the foot of Mount Sinai says, Exodus 21, verse 6, Then his master shall bring it. Now this is the, talking about a slave who has is been working for his master for a period of time, probably to pay off a debt or something. But he finds out that he likes where he's working. And maybe the master has given him a wife and he likes his wife and so forth like this. So he wants to stay there. And so what's going to happen? Then his master shall bring him to God. Then he shall bring, uh, shall bring him to the door of the, do, uh, the door or the doorpost and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl. I wonder what ear piercing is supposed to mean. And he shall serve him. Now the good news, I mean the New American Standard Bible says permanently. The good, what does the King James Bible say? Life. Forever. Forever. And Jim mentioned Jude 7. Let's go there. So how long is forever in that case? As long as he lives. Yeah, as long as it's supposed to last, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Jude 7 says, Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, are exhibited as an example of undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. Have any of you been to see, watch Sodom and Gomorrah burn? They're under water or if there is any water at that south end of the Dead Sea. It, uh, the Dead Sea is drying up pretty fast, isn't it? But, but apparently it, it was. Isaiah 34, uh, 10, mm -hmm. talking about the streams of Edom shall be turned into pitch and her soil into brimstone and her land shall become burning pitch. Night and day it shall not be quenched. Its smoke shall go up forever and ever, mm -hmm. forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. Mm -hmm. So, it sounds like in the Bible, forever and ever is, is sort of supposed to be as long as it's supposed to last, huh? Mm -hmm. Could it mean that? Okay, there is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast and its image, for anyone who has a mark of its name. So, can we read the three angels' messages in light of the things we've just talked about? Well, a third angel followed the first two, saying in a loud voice, whoever worships the beast... Whoever is controlled by influences outside of himself is willing to go with the flow, is more interested in being feeling comfortable than he is in doing what's right, and its image, part of the same thing, 
and receives the mark on their forehead or on their hand, Revelation 13, will themselves drink God's wine. And we've suggested that God's wine is his deceiving powers of false doctrines, etc. The wine of his fury is anger. And we've suggested that his anger is letting people go to reap the consequences of their own deceitful choices, their own perverse way, um, which he has poured at full strength into the cup of his anger. So this is, going, this is suggesting that the worst time, the time when God is going to step back almost completely from this earth and let Satan have full control is going to be when? Right down toward the end. Right at the very end, right? Yeah. And then in chapters 15 and 16, I think we're going to read about what happens mm -hmm. at that point in time. So God is going to step back and he's, he's going to just let all this happen. All who do this will be tormented in fire and sulfur before the holy angels and the Lamb. So what are the holy angels and the Lamb doing at that point in time? Coming on here. They're coming. Yeah. They're coming. They're, they're on their way to make this their future headquarters. It's going to be the millennium, of course, but this is, they're, they're coming to rescue the righteous out of this mess. The smoke of the fire, that is God's presence, that torments them goes up forever and ever. There is no relief day or night for those who worship the beast in his image, for everyone has the mark of its name. This will be permanent. <clears throat> this is, there's no second time around. This is it. And it calls for endurance on the part of God's people. The word is really endurance. It means you have to be really convinced. You have to, be, you have, to have the mark on your forehead that God's way is right, and you have to be committed to it no matter, even to the point of death. And that's what it's talking about here. And what are they committed to? They're committed to keeping the commandments of God and telling the truth about Jesus, speaking the message. Basically, that's the message of the Bible, isn't it? These are the people who, having been sealed by the Holy Spirit, which we said, who gave us the Bible? The Holy Spirit. God gave us, I mean, the Holy Spirit gives us the Bible by inspiring the prophets and the apostles. And so here we have summarized in this last third angel's message what we should be telling the world. Go to your Bible, learn the truth, and follow God. See you next week.